take a moment and think back. If you've ever been married before, think back to that time when you were first proposed to or when you did the proposing. Think back, try to get that picture in your mind, remembering where you were, what you were thinking, when someone for the first time asked you to spend the rest of your life with them, to unite with them, be with them forever, to share a life together. Or if you were doing the asking, maybe you were down on one knee, the little box popped open, asking someone to say yes to you, to spend the rest of their life with you, to love you, to cherish you, to covenant with you for better or for worse. Or if you've never been married before, maybe think to one of those times when you were witness such an event. Or for me, sometimes I'll watch these television shows where these couples you've been rooting for to get together for so long. And finally you think it might happen. And he, he asks the question, you're on the edge of your seat, and you're about ready to shout at the television. Her answer for her, yes, she says yes. Everybody's happy clap. Sometimes my wife and I will look at each other when it's a really sad scene. like, oh. Because it's just all very nice. I've been waiting for Castle and Beckett to get together on Castle. Anybody else watch Castle? Yeah, I, I know. I hope she's not dead, though. You know, season finale. Whew. But anyway, think back to those emotions. When you were proposed to, what were you thinking? Were you anxious? Were you nervous? Were you excited? Could you contain your joy? Were you a little scared? When you were doing the asking, were you apprehensive as to what her answer might be? Were you hopeful, but also just kind of nervous about what that future would bring if she said yes, and what that future would bring if she said no? Hold all of those emotions and memories. Remember them. Feel them again as you read this passage of Scripture this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. This is uh, this dialogue Jesus has with the disciples after their final meal together. They're called the last discourses. It's their final conversations to the disciples before the crucifixion. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let us pray. Come now, Lord, in power and come in might. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's kind of a fitting text for today in the lectionary, talking about Jesus coming back and all. Yesterday was supposed to be the rapture, according to many. You might have seen the news. Maybe that explains why we don't have a lot of an attendance today. Maybe they were raptured. I don't know. I don't know what that says for us. But in this passage, Jesus is talking about coming back. And I was thinking about that this week, and I thought about the first time I got a dog. You know, I was uh, in seminary, I wanted a dog so bad, but I couldn't fit a dog in my dorm room because it was about the size of this baptismal font. And a dog would not be happy there, but I wanted a dog so bad. I was looking forward to graduating and finding a church where I would be called to serve and working there and getting a dog. Whenever a church would contact me, I'd first look up the church on the internet, see what it was about. I'd look up the town, and then I'd go to Pet Finder and type in the zip code of that place and see what dogs were available. I was excited for a dog. And I said, ooh, I like this one, I like that one, I want to go and meet them. Or when I uh, did my candidating sermon at Delavan, I was picked up uh, at the airport by an older couple who I was going to stay with. And we went to Peoria Airport, and we were driving back to Delavan through Pekin, and we stopped at Taps Animal Shelter, first thing. And I went and went ahead and saw some dogs and got to know the shelter a bit. I moved there June 20th of 2006, and I wanted to go get a dog the next day. But my fiance at the time, Courtney, was still in New Jersey, and she would get mad if I just picked a dog without her. So I had to wait like three whole weeks. Because she was coming to visit in July. So as soon as we got, she got there, 
we went to taps again. It was July 3rd, and we went into the small dog room first, and they were all these yappy dogs, and it was giving me a headache. And I said, I, I can't stay in here, I gotta go out. And Courtney came back and said, come look at this dog. There's a little white dog in the bottom left corner in a little cage, looking a little unhappy to be among all those barky dogs. So let's take her out. She doesn't seem to really like it in there. So we asked and we took her out on a leash and she was a little white dog, about 30 pounds. She coughed a lot and she had no teeth and she had one eye. And, but she seemed so happy walking with us. And I still have this picture. Courtney was kind of bending down, scratching behind her ears. She's just sitting like this. I like this. And we sat down on a bench and I tapped and she jumped up and sat next to me. I'm like, let's get this dog. I want this dog. And Courtney's like, you sure you want this dog? Yeah, let's see if she'll fit in this little crate that a friend of mine had given us to maybe take her home in and see. So I got, went to the back of my Subaru out back there. It has the big trunk and opened it up to get the kennel out. And the dog jumped in the trunk and was like, okay, I'm ready to go. Let's go to your house now. I'm ready. Let's go. I'm like, well, wait a second here. You haven't done anything yet. We gotta see if you fit in here. So I opened up the cage and she walked right and sat down. I was like, okay, I'm ready. When are we leaving? Let's go to your house. We'll have a slumber party. It'll be fun. I'm like, well, we can't yet. I have to go and prepare a place for you first. So we had to take her back in. I felt really bad leaving her again because she didn't seem very happy there. But we had to go and get things for her. We didn't have a dog food bowl or a water bowl or dog food. And apparently dogs like food. We didn't have a dog bed or a leash or any of that thing. Those things. So we said, okay, listen, we'll be back. Don't worry, we have to go and prepare a place for you. I often wonder what she felt. Do you ever kind of sometimes wonder what these animals are thinking, your cat or your dog, as you leave or when you come back? I wonder if she was scared, if she hoped we would come back, if she was nervous or anxious or happy or sad. The disciples were pretty sad that night. And they thought it was going to be a great evening, this big feast in the upper room, but really their ministry with Jesus had hit a low point. It was their final meal with Jesus. They didn't know it at the time, but he kind of told them that. He told them that one of them would betray him into the hands of the Pharisees and the soldiers. He told them all that Peter would deny him. And they, of course, insisted, saying, No, 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 none of us would ever betray you. And Peter said, I would never deny you. They were troubled by this evening, which was not the Passover according to John. In John's Gospel, this happened on the day before the day of preparation, but in the Jewish calendar, when sun goes down, it's the next day. So really, it's a day of preparation. Just a normal meal, not the Passover meal. They thought this would just be this great evening over this nice meal. They thought Jesus was going to tell them that it was the good news was here, that the fight was almost over. Their three years together, according to John, it was three. Their three years together was coming to fruition, that Rome would soon be gone. The kingdom of God would reign. The night started off so happy over a meal, but things got heavy and depressing. Jesus knew they were feeling down and decided to tell them some good news in the midst of the bad. He said, listen, don't be upset. Trust God and trust me. You have up till now, so keep trusting in me. Listen, I'm going away, but I'm going for you. I'm going so I can get things ready for you, so we can be together forever, so you can have a home that will never decay or spoil or collapse. I'm going now. So we can be together forever. You will be with God forever. Life was always intended a special marriage. God and humanity. The fulfillment of the covenant. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And the disciples were a little confused hearing all that. I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Are you going to Bethlehem to prepare a place for us? Are you going to the French Mediterranean? That'd be nice. You're going and you're coming back. But you're going because you need to set things up for us. But, but where? With God? How? How? How are we going to get there? We don't know the way to this mystery place you're going. I imagine Jesus sighed one of those teacher sighs at that point. How many people are teachers or have been teachers or Sunday school teachers? When you've been explaining something for 30 minutes and you ask a question and the student goes, Wait, well, what page are we on? <sighs> <sighs> Jesus might have given one of those sighs. He says, You know where I'm going. I've been saying it all along and you know the way. I way. You just have to know me and I'll take care of it. I am all you need to know and to love and follow. By knowing me, by seeing me, you know God, your creator, the one who loves you, the one who wants to be with you forever. I don't know if the disciples knew it at the time, but I think they did. 
I think they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. Christ is actually, in a way, proposing here. At dinner, Christ is proposing to the disciples. God is proposing to them. Again, kind of. God has been proposing to humanity for generations. I will be your, my, your God. You will be my people. Come and follow me. Leave the land of your fathers behind. Come and follow me. Live in this covenant with me. Be with me. Unite with me, said God. We will dwell and live together forever. The covenant was made for this, but humanity has been wavering, thinking they needed more time, didn't want to be tied down, maybe needed an extended bachelor or bachelorette party. You remember all the stories, having a big party with a golden calf, worshiping these other gods, going and doing this or that, kind of leaving God behind, and then when things kind of get bad, oh, I still love you, God, I'm back, I'm back, and then running off this way again. Maybe they thought they needed more time, and God has waited, and God has waited. And God has waited. Waited more than most of us would. But God has waited. Until Christ the bridegroom comes again and offers once more, Marry me. Covenant with me. Let's be together. Who here thinks they had the shortest engagement? Everybody in the congregation. Anybody think they had a pretty short engagement? Anybody? No one? At the early service, Steve Norval was pretty amazing. He said he met his uh, wife on a blind date on September 6th and asked her to marry him on September 10th. I know. Love at first sight, I guess, happened. Then they were married a few months later. So that's pretty short. Anybody have a really long engagement? I know Aaron and Ann, you're like two years, couple months. Anybody over two years, five months? Tom, how long? Two and a half? Three, that beat, I was about two years and seven months, six months. So three beats me. You know, why do you have these long engagements or short engagements? Why don't you just get engaged and get married the next day? You know, I mean, that's possible, right? Just go on down to the Las Vegas and you can get it all done. <laughs> Oftentimes we want to prepare things. Right? Sometimes we have these ideas and these dream weddings. We have to reserve the church and the reception place. You've got to get flowers and cater. Sometimes you just got to get everything in order legally to get married. Get a job. Get set up. For me, I was in seminary. I had to finish seminary. Courtney had to finish her graduate school. Then she had a job. I wanted to make sure I got out of seminary, had a job, a home, and stability there. So we had to wait a while. We had to get things prepared and set up. Sometimes that waiting can seem like forever. Sometimes it goes by quick. But you know you have to prepare certain things. The Jewish custom at the time of Jesus was for a man to get engaged to a woman and then go build a home. And he would build that home on his father's house. They would have this courtyard in the middle. And each time a son was going to get married, he would build on an addition around that courtyard. There would be many dwelling places around a father's house. And once that house was ready, once he had prepared the home, he would go back to his betrothed and say, I prepared a place for us. Now we can get married. And that's when they joined together. That's when they had that union and they move in together in that home in his father's house. Now that sounds very familiar to what Jesus is saying, doesn't it? Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I wouldn't I tell you this. Jesus is basically saying here, I'm going to go build an addition onto my father's house, and there we will live forever. The early hearers of this gospel would have recognized that immediately. They would have seen and heard what Jesus said, and they would have been reminded. A woman might have been reminded the first time a man had proposed to her in this way and waited for him to build the house. A man hearing these words of Jesus would have remembered the time he had proposed to a young lady and then went and built his own home for them together. These would have brought back those memories of marriage right away. And that's why I want you to think about your own proposal and your time waiting to get married this morning because that's what the original hearers would have been thinking about. Because that's what God wants for each of us, to have that union. To have that place for us to live with God forever. To have that kind of covenant and marriage with God. On July 5th, two days later, Courtney and I went back to Taps with a crate and some treats and we got our dog. We gave her a new name, Hildegard. Hildy for short. 
and a new life with us. She got right in her crate and we put her in and we took her home. And she was our dog. We were her people. And she lived with us and we loved her. It was just great. She was my first dog, my best friend. We lived together until she passed away last June. We loved Hildy and Hildy loved us. We promised we'd come back for her. And we did. When I got our new dog in July from uh, Paws, um, when I first fought, set, found her, she was in the little cage there, it's kind of in the back. And then we got her out and she went and hugged me, then she'd hug Courtney, then she'd hug me, then she'd hug Courtney. Like, wow, you know how to play this game well. <laughs> how, how are you going to say no to that? You can't. <laughs> when I went back the next day to drop off some paperwork, I saw her again. She, this time she recognized me, I think. She ran to the front of the cage and stuck her little paw through. It was like, hello, you said you'd come back and get me. Why am I still in this cage? I just have to wait two more days. you got to get spayed and all that. She was excited to come home with us. There was that excitement, that longing, just looking in her eyes, her little hand, paw through the cage. I wonder how many of us feel that way about Christ coming back. Think about it for a second. You know, yesterday was supposed to be the rapture and all. Now, I didn't ever really buy into it from the beginning, but what if I had? What if you really believed that tomorrow Jesus would be coming back? Honestly, how would you feel about it? You know, if I'm honest with myself, part of it would be like, but there's so much more I want to do here. I don't know if I'm ready to go yet. You ever think about that? I wonder if people who really believe this are kind of breathing a sigh of relief, saying, oh, well, I have this and this and this I want to do. Does my heart long for Jesus coming back in that way? Or do I have other things I want to do here? What does that say about that relationship, if that's the case? You know, Christ has basically asked us, unite with me, marry me. I'm going to come back, and we're going to be together. Now, some of us may have said yes, and it's like, absolutely, we'll say yes. But we kind of said yes in that way. You say yes, you don't really want to say yes, but you're not good at saying no. And you know, my friend once asked, you know, would you I go on this double-blind date with them? I'm like, sure. And then right after that, I'm like, how do I get out of this? Hopefully that person will get sick, or maybe I can develop a cough. Because you didn't really want to say yes, but you felt bad about saying no. Maybe some of us have been that way with Jesus. We say, well, yes, we're supposed to say yes, but deep down, we're like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see how it goes. Some of us have said yes, but kind of thought about, well, Christ isn't actually here, so I can still do my own thing for a while and go off and do this and this. I can still have other passions. I had a friend in college who had this interesting philosophy that if you weren't in the same state, it wasn't cheating. I don't know how his girlfriend thought about this, but that was his philosophy. And I think sometimes that's how we treat Jesus. We say, well, he's not here with us right now in the body. So, I mean, I can still have other first loves. I can, I can love money. I can put my family first. I can put an image of what my life should be first. I can put popularity first or my job first. I can put all my heart into these things. And then when Jesus comes back, then I'll switch over. Some of us think that way, don't we? We put all our passions and different things in life. And then when Jesus comes back, then, then we'll switch to him. But he's not here right now, so we've got to do other things. But if that was our relationship with our spouse, would that work in our long-distance relationship? Even if you talk on the phone every night? Is that how we treat God? Maybe we said no. We said, not right now, Jesus. I don't want to commit to anything. I don't want to be tied down. I want to live my life. Maybe when I'm on my deathbed, then I'll say yes if you're still holding that ring out there. But just not right now. Maybe it's better to be honest than to just lie and lead people on. Or maybe you said yes, and ever since that sprinkle of water on your forehead... Ever since that profession of faith in front of the church, ever since that mountaintop experience, that blinding road experience, you've been preparing for Christ ever since, longing for Christ to come back, longing to be together forever. <clears throat> Which one are you? How do you really feel about Christ coming back? Which are you? That's the question kind of this morning. Because Christ asks this question and says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Are you going to move in when I come back? 
And I think it's kind of mean of us to say, oh yes, this is a nice backup plan for when I die, it'll be nice. But until then, I'm just going to do my own thing. We want someone to treat us that way. But that's how we often treat this relationship with Jesus is. Now let's be honest with ourselves. I know I do sometimes. So which are you? Have you or will you truly commit to Jesus mind, body, and soul or just toy with Him and lead Him on? Or you just say no thinking, well, maybe I can do better. And Christ has popped the question. And every time there is a yes, we throw an engagement party here at church, don't we? We had a celebration last Sunday for confirmation. We had a celebration for baptism. So if you ever say yes, let us know. Because we want to celebrate with you. Because it is a thing to celebrate, a relationship that lasts forever. And if you haven't said yes yet, or if you've said one of those yeses that are kind of tentative yes, just think about what that means. It's a challenging question to take with you today. If God, if Christ were really to come back this week, what, were you, what would your emotions be like? Compare those with the emotions, maybe, of when you were first asked to marry someone. Compare those maybe to the emotions of seeing the love or hoping for that love story that's going to happen to you one day. What are the differences? What are the similarities? And why do you think there are those differences and similarities? Why do you think those are there? Just think about that this week. That Christ wants us to marry Him forever. What's our answer? How do our lives, how our lives lived based on that answer? Think about that this week. Think about Christ saying, I have promised to prepare a place for you, and I'm coming back. What does that mean for you, for your future? We often think about that, the future, heaven, death. But what does that mean now? What does that mean today? Do you live any differently engaged than you did before? What does that mean for you today that Christ has asked you forever be with me? Let us pray together.